by NRDC. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. You are listening to it on Boston Free Radio and I am your host and movie critic Dan Burke. Just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of your host and movie critic Dan Burke. And those are not just opinions about movies, they're opinions about other things as well. These opinions about movies or otherwise do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of anyone any employees who are listening to this or who are working at the station to which you are listening to this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, let's get into the show. I've got four movies to review for you for this show, but first let's get into my usual segment, What's Topping the Box Office? The top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. This past weekend being Thanksgiving weekend. And the numbers that are tabulated here are those that are compiled between... Friday through Sunday, and even though it was Thanksgiving weekend, and Thanksgiving was, of course, a holiday most people had off, that Thursday of Thanksgiving does not count in this case. So, last week, the number one movie at the box office was Justice League. This movie, number one at the box office, excuse me, this week, the number one movie at the box office was Coco, the latest film from Disney and Pixar, which is one of the four movies I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show. I'll get into what I thought about that movie later, but first, let me tell you that this weekend, Coco grossed $50.8 $50.8 million. That's $50.8 million. Great start for Coco. Against a budget of 175 to $200 million, somewhere in that range, but I'm not given a specific number, Coco was so far grossed in the United States $72.9 million since its opening on Wednesday, and around the world has already grossed $159.2 million. So it's not a hit here in the States or around the world, but it's off to a great start. Justice League slipped from number one last week to number two this week, having grossed $41.1 million over the Thanksgiving weekend, which is not bad. Against a very hefty budget of $300 million, Justice League has so far grossed $171.9 million here in the States and $482.9 million around the world. Now, I did some number tabulations, and I compared Justice League's first weekend at the box office to... The Avengers first weekend of the box office, but I don't know if I'm going to have time to get into those numbers. If I have time later on in the show, I'll do my comparisons, but for right now, I'm just moving on down the list. Number three at the box office this weekend was number two last week, and that movie was Wonder, starring Julia Roberts, Owen Wilson, and Jacob Tremblay. Wonder grossed $22.7 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $20 million, Wonder has so far grossed $69.8 million here in the States and $70.3 million around the world, which means that in every other country besides the United States, Wonder has only grossed $0.5 million, or approximately $500,000. But it doesn't matter because here in the States, it is a certified hit, and around the world, it is also vicariously a certified hit. Thor Ragnarok is doing extremely well in its fourth week in release. It hasn't topped Justice League, but then again, Thor Ragnarok has been out for four weeks and Justice League has been out for two. But I wouldn't be surprised that if I saw Justice League dip below Thor Ragnarok, but I'm just speculating here. This weekend, Thor Ragnarok grossed $16.9 million against a budget of $180 million, which is $120 million less than Justice League, mind you. Think about that. Thor Ragnarok has grossed so far in the United States $277.7 million, and around the world it has grossed a staggering $791.5 million. So Thor Ragnarok is a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. But I wouldn't be surprised to eventually see it certified here in the States as well. Daddy's Home 2, number 4 at the box office last week, number 5 at the box office this week, having grossed $13.2 million at the box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $69 million, Daddy's Home 2 has so far grossed $72.6 million here in the States and $87.7 million around the world, making it a tentative hit both here in the States and around the world. It could be a certified hit in both instances by Christmas, but of course, as usual, we'll have to see. 
Murder on the Orient Express is a movie that is struggling against some of the heavyweights, especially movies like Coco, Justice League, and Thor Ragnarok. But all things considered, being arguably the only adult movie on the list, uh, in the top ten, arguably, it is doing pretty well for itself in its third week in release. It grossed $13.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend, almost the exact same as Daddy's Home 2, just a little less. Against a budget of $55 million, Murder on the Orient Express has so far grossed $74.4 million at the U.S. box office and $197.3 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. The Star was number six at the box office last week, was number seven at the box office this past weekend. It grossed $6.9 million in its second week in release, which is not a lot, but against a budget of $20 million, The Star has so far grossed $22.1 million here in the States and $23.9 million worldwide. That's including in the States. So The Star is not doing especially well, but it is a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. And given the upcoming holiday season or the holiday season in which we are currently right now, it could inch its way up to being a certified hit. A Bad Mom's Christmas is number eight at the box office this weekend, having grossed $4.9 million. Against a budget of $28 million, though, A Bad Mom's Christmas has so far grossed $59.6 million here in the States and $92.8 million around the world, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. So the holiday season has been very good to that movie. Roman J. Israel Esquire is in its second week in release, but its first week in release nationwide, and this movie is generating some well-deserved Oscar buzz. But in terms of uh, b- budget numbers, it's grossed $4.4 million at the U.S. box office so far. Against a budget of $22 million, Roman J. Israel Esquire has so far grossed $6.2 million, meaning that it's not a hit and it has a very long way to go to recoup its budget, but it just may. Also having a long way to go is Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, which grossed $4.4 million this past weekend, a fraction below Roman J. Israel Esquire. Against a budget of $15 million, Three Billboards, you know the rest, has so far grossed $7.6 million here in the States. I do not have the international numbers for this movie. You're not wired to have a response to this sound. You're neutral to it, and you can hear it repeatedly without feeling anything. But when we introduce a new stimulus, save the food, we've achieved pulling a natural or inborn response from you. Save the food, because 40% of all food in the US never gets eaten. Save the food, cook it, store it, share it, just don't waste it. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com, brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. Hey everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. But if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder that Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access Television, or a local television station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them, whoever you are, I say thank you, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Coco. This is the long-awaited release from Disney Pixar, and it is the second movie that Disney P- Pixar has released this year. The first one they released was earlier this summer, Cars 3, which didn't do as well as expected at the box office. In fact, I'm not actually looking at the numbers, but just a brief digression. Cars 3, I think, made less money than Despicable Me 3, which is really unfortunate. But 
Coco probably makes up for what Cars 3 lacks. And that's probably a little bit of a spoiler about what I thought of the movie. But let me give you a little bit of background of this movie. So Coco is a CGI animated movie from Disney Pixar, as I said. And it tells the story of aspiring musician Miguel, who's an 11-year-old boy who, when confronted with his family's ancestral ban on music, enters the land of the dead to work out the mystery. So Miguel is a Latino boy, specifically he is Mexican, and he belongs to a family of shoemakers, which was started by his great-great-grandmother, who was married to a man, Miguel's great-great-grandfather, who had musical aspirations and consequently left his family to pursue those musical aspirations. Since then, his great-great-grandmother has passed down a legacy not only of starting her own business and becoming successful at that, which is very good, especially for a woman, especially for a Mexican woman. But she also passed down her hatred of music, which is like it usually is in in these movies, particularly Disney movies, not particularly fair and not very well founded. But in any event, 12-year-old Miguel, I said he was 11 years old. I apologize for that. He's 12 in this movie. 12-year-old Miguel is part of this family business, but he also has very secret musical aspirations, much to the chagrin of his grandmother, whose name I can't quite remember. There there are a lot of characters in this movie, but Miguel, who's voiced by a newcomer named Anthony Gonzalez, who is, I, I don't know his age, but he's probably around the age of 12. But anyway, Miguel has an admiration for a certain old... Very old Mexican musician by the name of Ernesto de la Cruz, who's voiced in this movie by Benjamin Bratt. And even though Ernesto de la Cruz is worshipped in this Mexican town, his family, Miguel's family, does not worship him, even when Miguel is convinced that Ernesto de la Cruz is actually Miguel's great great grandfather. So eventually, Miguel wanders into Ernesto de la Cruz's shrine and picks up his guitar, uh, Ernesto de la Cruz's guitar, and starts playing it. Unbeknownst to Miguel, he finds that just from strumming this guitar once, he is temporarily dead and could actually be permanently dead if he doesn't find a family member to give him a blessing to bring him back to the real world. In the meantime, Miguel and his somewhat dumb dog who is <laughs> who reminded me of Bill the Cat from the Bloom County comic strips and cartoons embark on the land of the dead and this this happens on November 1st which for those of you who are not familiar with Mexican folklore and heritage November 1st is El Dia de los El Dio de los Muertos which is the day of the dead and it's a holiday that is a little similar to Halloween in in the U.S. And I don't want to overgeneralize it, but it has more of a religious connotation in Mexico. And admittedly, I was actually surprised that Coco was released in theaters weeks after El Dia de los Muertos, but that's just... <laughs> It it doesn't seem to hurt the movie in terms of box office numbers. And once the movie gets going and you go on this journey with Miguel and you actually see the land of the dead, the way the Disney Pixar animators animated it, you will not care what month or what day you're watching this movie. You'll just be taken aback by this film. It is beautifully animated. I think already, I, I can't exactly say... What is the best Disney Pixar movie and what's the worst? I have an idea what's the worst, but I would probably say Coco, already from watching it, is in the top five, if not the top three. I'm not going to go as far as to say it's the best, but it is a wonderful movie. It's directed by Lee Ungrick and Adrian Molina, or maybe Adrian Molina, who both co-directed the movie, and it's based on original. It's based on an original idea by Lee Unkrich. So this is another Disney Pixar movie that is completely original. And even though it has some similarities in terms of themes, you know, pursuing one's ambitions, 
versus being true to a family. It doesn't really matter. I love the characters in this film. As I said, I love the animation. And if the Academy Awards or the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences does not nominate the song Remember Me for Best Original Song, there is something wrong with the Academy. That's a great song. All the music in this movie is great. It tells an amazing story. The the characters were not only well animated, but they were voice cast perfectly. And if I give anything more away about this story, I'm going to spoil it. But there are some interesting twists and turns, some of which you see coming, some of which you don't. But the ending to this movie, which I won't give away had me fighting back tears it really did and it's been a long time probably since toy story 3 which was also directed by lee unkrick by the way i think it was toy story 3 was probably the last one where i was really fighting back tears or at least the last animated movie but it goes without saying that coco is a knockout it is a fantastic movie and even though i usually don't see movies twice coco's a movie that i may see again and one thing i'd like to do is i I'd actually like to see this movie completely in Spanish, and I would love for Disney Pixar, if they're listening, to release a Spanish cut of this movie in the United States. I'd go see it. Open road, here comes the Hefley family. You've packed the smartphones, headphones, tablets, water snacks, cooler, sunscreen, bikes, skateboards, games, videos, sunglasses. There's no room for people in here. Just don't wimp out on the most important thing. Deep Deep fried fried butter on a stick. stick. No, seatbelts. Whether it's a long haul or short trip. It's a win-win situation. Never give up until they buckle up. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Man Who Invented Christmas. Is this a movie about Jesus? No, it isn't. And technically, Jesus didn't invent Christmas. He was just born on Christmas Day, or at least that's what we're told. And I I can't exactly verify whether or not that's true. That's for another talk show host who talks about something else besides movies, probably about religion, to talk about for you. Instead, I'm going to get into this movie, The Man Who Invented Christmas, which is based on a book of the same name by Les Standiford, which is not actually historical fiction, I don't think. But the book is available in stores, and had I known that this was actually based on a book. I probably would have read the book before I'd seen the movie, but the the movie, I actually did not tell you what it's about. It is a true story, sort of. It is a biography slash comedy slash drama, and it is details the journey that led to Charles Dickens' creation of A Christmas Carol, a timeless tale that would redefine the holiday. And redefine the holiday, it certainly did. Although, I think you would get a better sense uh, from the book upon which it's based how people celebrated or, matter of fact, didn't celebrate Christmas before Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol, the, the, the story which, of course is about Ebenezer Scrooge and his being visited by three ghosts to reclaim his soul. And you, you know the story. But anyway, Charles Dickens in this movie is played by Dan Stevens, who is a British actor. And he has been in such movies as, well, he's actually, he was actually a regular on Downton Abbey, and he played the Beast in the recent Disney live action adaptation of Beauty and the Beast. So, 
He plays this part actually without a beard, which is kind of strange, because I would have thought by 1843, when this movie takes place, Charles Dickens would have had a beard. But that's not actually my my problem with the movie, so I'll put that aside. It is a reimagining of what Charles Dickens' creative process would have been when writing A Christmas Carol, the immortal story about Scrooge. So the things I liked about this movie was the fact that you're introduced to Charles Dickens, who is already actually a celebrity by 1843. The problem is he wrote three stories before A Christmas Carol, all of which were disappointments, I I think financially. So he goes to his publisher and he tells them he wants to write A Christmas Story. And the only indication that Christmas is not celebrated or as revered in 1843 as it is today is that his publishers are saying, come on, nobody wants to read a Christmas story. In fact, the only reason our our personal assistant celebrates Christmas is just to have the day off. And from there, especially if you know the Christmas uh, A Christmas Carol, or get the gist of it. In other words, not only if you know the story, but also if you know a lot of the lines that Charles Dickens originally wrote, you'll find a lot of Easter eggs in this film. And that's probably the biggest asset of this film. Not only the fact that you see Charles Dickens' creative process, but you also see Charles Dickens in this movie, and this may have been fictionalized, doing what a lot of writers do when they're trying to come up with ideas. They procrastinate quite a bit. So you see Charles Dickens writing, but you also see him doing stretches and also playing with his accordion, and those were the parts of the movie that I thought were actually the most relatable, and what a lot of people are going to remember about this film years from now. But also you see Charles Dickens actually inventing these characters in his head, and almost in somewhat of a schizophrenic kind of way, the characters, especially Scrooge himself, who in this movie is played by Christopher Plummer, keep following him and try to keep shaping the story with him. So there's a little bit of a fantasy element to this as well, but it's probably more of a creative process that's fictionalized more than a fantasy that you would take for face value. So what I loved about The Man Who Invented Christmas is seeing Charles Dickens come up with these ideas and taking them piece by piece and ultimately creating a very original Christmas story that ultimately became a timeless Christmas story, which we still read and see countless incantations of on the screen to this day. Some of the incantations are better than others, but I haven't really actually seen a bad cinematic version of A Christmas Carol. In fact, I kind of wish that I was hosting this show back in 2009, because then I would tell you exactly what I thought of the Jim Carrey starring and Robert Zemeckis directing movie released by Disney, but that's another story for another time. Maybe I'll do that for uh, a show dedicated to holiday movies later on. But The Man Who Invented Christmas is not bad. I would probably say its biggest weakness is you don't get an idea what Christmas was how Christmas was celebrated before the writing of A Christmas Carol, how reading and writing or rather people reading the Christmas Carol decided oh I'm going to celebrate the holiday season this way and you you don't really get a sense of that you're only really told what Christmas was and what Christmas ultimately became because of the story through spoken exposition and also the title cards that give you a written epilogue. And it's not enough for this movie to tell you about how Christmas used to be celebrated or lack thereof. You really have to actually show it. With that said, I think that The Man Who Invented Christmas also gave us a number of interesting tidbits about the novella that Charles Dickens wrote, particularly that the novella was actually first published in book form on December 19th, 1843. So just six days before Christmas. But by Christmas Eve of that same year, all the copies that were printed of The Christmas Carol were sold out. And the book never went out of print after that. Never. 
So that was the thing I found the most interesting. But the movie is called The Man Who Invented Christmas. And you see him writing a classic Christmas story, but you don't get a sense of how he, quote-unquote, invented Christmas. So it is serviceable, this movie, but it gets my rating of a checkout because in terms of its historical significance, it does leave a lot more to be desired. However, I, this is possibly going to be Welcome a Christmas back classic. Welcome the cat show. Up next, we have Nico. Nico is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right. A group known especially for their sunspot sleeping, ball chasing, leg rubbing, and of course, companionship. Just look how she struts. It's like she owns the place. And see how she curls up and cuddles her person. The pitch on her purring is simply perfect. Nice one. Fantastic cat. But really the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Nico is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. I love those real sick signs They're the ones that move me A thinly blown Neurotic tone Intensify and groove me all this and more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Wonder. Now, I'm a little bit late for reviewing this movie, particularly because it came out not last weekend, but the weekend before that. But I held off on viewing this movie for one specific reason. I wanted to read the book first. Wonder is one of those books written by R.J. Palacio. I, I hope that's how you pronounce her name. That I've passed by whenever I've been in a bookstore, and I've always looked at the cover, and I thought to myself, okay, I hear a lot of great things about this book, but i got to get around to reading it. And one of the things I try to do when reviewing movies is, I, especially if they're based on books, I want to read the book first. I don't always succeed in that, but... Reading the book before you see the movie is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you get to read a great novel upon which something else is good enough to be based. But on the other hand, from my experience, in almost every instance, the book is always better than the movie. And that was my big problem with the Harry Potter films. Not that there was anything particularly wrong with them. It was just, I read the Harry Potter books. In fact, I read all four of the Harry Potter books that came out before the first cinematic adaptation of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And when I saw that movie, I thought it was okay, but they didn't live up to the book for me in terms of what the characters looked like, some of them. But on the whole... The, the the Harry Potter movies I saw were serviceable, but after the third one, I just didn't get into the movies because I would only be disappointed. So, back to the book Wonder. I read it over Thanksgiving break. I actually read it in a single day. The book is 310 pages, but it took me just a couple hours to read it because it's on, a I think, a third, maybe second grade reading level. But I, I was pleasantly surprised because... Now that I've read the book, I can go see the movie. And Wonder is a book that tells the incredibly inspiring and heartwarming story of August Pullman, an 11-year-old boy with facial differences, uh, excuse me, a 10-year-old boy, I'm getting the ages wrong today, a 10-year-old boy with facial differences who enters fifth grade attending a mainstream elementary school for the first time. So the book actually details what the symptom is that causes August Pullman's face to be in a politically incorrect term disfigured it's actually it's not it's it's detailed in the book but it's it's alleged that he has this medical facial difference so it's referred to in the book a very mouthful of a word as mandibulofacial dysotosis which is basically like Treacher Collins syndrome, although it's not ex ex explicitly stated in the book. But that syndrome, which I won't repeat the name of, is what Rocky Dennis had. And Rocky Dennis is the subject of the movie Mask, and he was played by Eric Stoltz in a great but very unrecognizable performance by him. Very much like Eric Stoltz in Mask, you won't be able to recognize Jacob Tremblay as Augie Pullman in the movie Wonder, but... 
it doesn't matter because very much like Eric Stoltz, Jacob Tremblay does a, an amazing job in this film. I mean, he's kind of the go-to kid when it comes to heartbreaking movies about kids, although this movie's not as heartbreaking as his previous effort, which was Room. And when I see Jacob Tremblay in movies, I still keep thinking the same thing as I thought when I saw the movie Room. Man, you are a great actor. Please br- grow up to be more like Ron Howard and less like... Miley Cyrus, please. You were just way too good. But Jacob Tremblay continues his hot streak in this movie, which is directed by and has the screenplay written by Stephen Shablowski. And Stephen Shablowski, excuse me, I I mispronounced his name. Stephen Shablowski is the writer of the book and the director of the movie. uh, uh, oh, Oh, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Temporarily forgot the name right there. The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which I hear great things about, but that's a movie that came out a little while before I did the show. I didn't get to see it, but I I hear great things about it. But Stephen Chabowski does an amazing job directing this film. He has a lot of source material to live up to, as well as an ardent fan base. But even though this film, I don't think, matched the book in terms of quality. I still think it's a very high quality movie and certainly Jacob Tremblay's performance stuck with me as I was watching the film. I also really liked the interestingly cast Julia Roberts and Owen Wilson as Augie Pullman's parents. And even though I I would have thought that maybe Jennifer Garner would have been a more obvious choice for Augie Pullman's mom, Julia Roberts over Jennifer Garner is not anything to thumb your nose at. I think Julia Roberts does a really good job in this movie. I also have to give credit to a young actress who plays Augie Pullman's protective sister the character's name is via short for olivia and she's played by a young actress named isabella vitovic who i thought was also excellent in this film and also there are a number of very you know well cast actors in this film i thought just about everyone in this film was well cast but one of the characters that was interestingly cast in this movie and if you don't mind i'm just going to check out the name here, was a young actor named Naji Jeter, who plays the role of Justin, who is Via's boyfriend. And this is a a role I wouldn't have thought would go to a black actor, but I didn't care once I saw Naji Jeter's performance here. And in the book, there's a lot more emphasis on Justin's character. In fact, he's given his whole point of view in one chapter. But even though I wanted to see more of Naji Naji Jeter in this film, I thought he did an excellent job as well. I'm not exactly sure what the Academy is going to think of this movie but I thought for what it was, even though it didn't entirely live up to the book, the book had a lot to offer, and I think Wonder came extremely close to the book's emotional depth. And also, you're going to love Augie Pullman when you see this movie. Gets my rating of a knockout. And if it's any indication to me, probably one of the things that might have spoiled how I thought about the movie objectively is the fact that I did read that the the author of Wonder, R.J. Palacio, loved the movie. So I, I guess me loving the movie and her loving the movie will mean probably you will love it as well. The Western Scrub Jay. I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, Arr! He had spotted the elusive black swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine-year-old boy. He had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Hi, listen to me, Ed Robleski, every Wednesday from 5 to 7 for Talking Hendrix, where we will celebrate the music and legacy of Jimi Hendrix's career and much more. Tune in every Wednesday from 5 to 7 when we hear on Boston Free Radio.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder that Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Scat V or a community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Lady Bird. This is another movie I was late to, even though it came out about two or three weeks ago, but I made it a point to see it this Thanksgiving weekend, and I am really glad I did. So it takes place in the early 2000s, or the early aughts, approximately 2002 to 2003, and the movie is about an artistically inclined 17-year-old who comes of age in Sacramento, California. The movie was written by Screenplay and Story, and directed by Greta Gerwig, who actually does not make a cameo in this movie, but she makes her directorial directorial, excuse me, debut with this film. And Greta Gerwig is an actress who I've liked to a certain point, but I have found that her later movies, especially the ones she's done with um, Noah Baumbach, have been her playing basically the same character again and again. This millennial who's somewhat jaded and also very artistically inclined. And I thought that even though I think Greta Gerwig is a fantastic actress, I was a little afraid of her being typecast in that role up until the time she's 40. But if there's any indication that she might be typecast, she certainly has a bright future ahead of her as a director because Lady Bird is certainly a movie that is very memorable. Memorable, not only for its direction and its sharp writing, but also for its performances, especially by Saoirse Ronan, who I absolutely love. She plays the titular Lady Bird in this movie, whose name is actually Christine McPherson, but for some reason that's not entirely explained, but doesn't need to be. She goes through her senior year wanting to be known as Lady Bird. Again, if, uh, an explanation probably would have been welcome, but didn't necessarily need to be there. Either way, what you know about Lady Bird is that she is living in San Francisco in a lower middle class family with her mother, Marion, played by Lori Metcalf, and her underemployed father, Larry, played by Tracy Letts. She also has an older brother named Miguel, who may or may not be adopted, who is out of high school but is struggling as well, living at home with his parents, working at a grocery store, but at least he's still working. So the movie focuses a lot on Lady Bird's senior year of high school in a private Catholic school, Catholic all-girls school, by the way, and her contentious relationship with her mother, Marion. And Saoirse Ronan and... Uh, Lori Metcalf, best known for playing Roseanne's sister Jackie on the classic sitcom Roseanne, make this movie special and certainly made it make it very relatable, particularly if you've had contentious relationships with your parents. Maybe some more than others. I don't want to drop any hints about what my relationship with my family is like. That is another story for another time. But I thought both of them did an amazing job in this film. Certainly, you can see both characters' points of view. You can you can also relate to maybe your senior year where you're getting ready for college. You don't know what to do with your life. And you're not exactly enthusiastic about the, the place you live. And even though Lady Bird lives in Sacramento, California, I mean, you'd think California being the sunshine state would just be paradise, but I guess it really depends on whether you grew up there or whether you're visiting, because some places are a great place to visit, but as the saying goes, you wouldn't want to live there. At the other, On the other hand, there is the cliche of the grass being greener on the other side of the fence. I think somebody like me probably would have been thrilled to have maybe gone to college in Sacramento, but 
then again, I might be confusing Sacramento with San Francisco or L.A., not, not in terms of the names of the cities, but in terms of what their reputations are and also what would be an ideal destination. So Lady Bird, played by Saoirse Ro- uh, Ronan, who is not actually 17, by the way. She's still a young actress. She's, as of this show, 23 years old, but I think she's young enough to probably play a high schooler until she's 30 but of course she is jaded she certainly has her strengths and her weaknesses in character but everything she's going through in this film regarding her relationship with her best friend her falling out with one friend and a budding relationship with another her contemplating her losing virginity to uh, a boyfriend of hers her experiencing heartbreak, setback, and also the 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 struggle of going to the college she wants versus the college that it's guaranteed her family can afford. This is everything is in this movie is relatable, even if you're not a girl. And I love the movie for for this reason, its relatability. And I wasn't like Lady Bird when I was in high school, but I know a lot of people who were or who were very similar. So, And I also identify with a lot of the feelings that Lady Bird goes through. And when I was watching this film, I completely forgot that Saoirse Ronan is Irish. Because she seemed so American in this movie and not just her accent. I just completely forgot about her performance two years ago in Brooklyn. Which, by the way, I loved her in that movie so much I wanted to cuddle her. In, In this movie, I don't quite feel the same way. But it's just a testament to Saoirse Ronan's acting that she can play someone who's incredibly lovable and poignant and at the at the same time play someone who has the kind of wild mood swings that makes you want to stay away from them. But either way, I loved Lady Bird. I thought Saoirse Ronan and Laurie Metcalf did commendable jobs in this movie. Not only commendable, outstanding. And I would like to see both of them be nominated for Oscars. And in case you didn't know, Lady Bird gets my rating of a knockout. I'm not not sure if it's autobiographical or semi-autobiographical through Greta Gerwig. I don't want to make that assumption, but what I can tell you is that it is a great movie, and I think it will stand the test of time. We'll have to see. Did you just look down at your phone? You did it again, didn't you? You know, you're flying down the road in a three-ton hunk of steel, and a text takes your eyes off the road for an average of five seconds. At 55 miles per hour, that's long enough to travel the length of a football field and cause some serious damage. Turn it off. Trust me. Whatever it is, you'll live. Learn more at StopTechStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've gone through all four movies I'm going to review for you for this show, I'm going to start the last segment of my show early. Of course, I'm going to have a break in between. That segment is What's Coming Out Next. These are the movies that may or may not be coming to a theater near you, but whether or not they are, I will let you know. And unfortunately, this coming weekend, because so many great movies opened last weekend, like Coco, uh, probably most notably, there aren't a ton of movies that are coming out in wide release. However, there is one that is guaranteed to be coming to a theater near you. And this one I'm really excited to see. This one is The Disaster Artist. Now, this is based on a true story about the making of reputedly the worst film ever made. So maybe this will take more than a whole segment because I got a lot to say about the movie 
the movie about a movie. So this is a true story about an actor named Greg Sestero who meets the weird and mysterious Tommy Wiseau in an acting class. And from there, they form a unique friendship and travel to Hollywood to make their dreams come true. That's the sugar-coated part of it. But both Greg Sestero and Tommy Wiseau collaborate and make an independent film called The Room, which is reputed to be the worst film of all time. And having seen it, Probably about 10 times by now. I can say that it most certainly deserves that title. Yeah, The Room is a movie that should be called Murphy's Movie because just about everything that could possibly go wrong with the movie went wrong with The Room. First of all, you have a guy who's the lead actor who is probably one of the least attractive men I've ever seen. And you also have the acting in the movie, which is subpar, the the subplots that go nowhere, the writing that is absolutely ridiculous, and there are bl- green screen shots that are just absolutely terrible. And that's not even scratching the surface of what makes this movie bad. So... The, 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 the Disaster Artist is directed by James Franco. It's based on the book of the same name by Greg Sestero, who uh, who, uh, who co-starred in The Room. And James Franco actually plays Tommy Wiseau. And Tommy Wiseau himself will make a cameo appearance as a guy named Henry. And interestingly enough... James Franco's younger brother, Dave Franco, who's a good actor in his own right, is actually playing Greg Sestero. So I haven't seen any of the previews, but one of the the skepticisms I have about this film is I don't think James Franco should play Tommy Wiseau while Dave Franco is playing Greg Sestero because the two brothers look enough alike so that you know they're brothers. They don't look exactly alike, but you can definitely see the resemblance. And secondly, James Franco is a good-looking guy. Tommy Wiseau is not. So I think James Franco might have miscast himself based on that. But at the same time, there are a lot of other actors who join James and Dave Franco in this movie, including Seth Rogen, who plays the director Sandy Schler. I think that's how his name is pronounced. You have Alison Brie playing an actress named Amber. And you also have... Uh, people cameoing as themselves in this movie, including Lizzie Kaplan, Kristen Bell, and Brian Cranston, who are allegedly, who are actually unabashed fans of this worst movie ever made, The Room. And I got to tell you, just briefly before moving on, The Room I have detailed as the worst movie I've ever enjoyed watching. This is a movie that is so bad, as the saying goes. Now, I'm not even going to say it's so bad it's good, because I don't want to say that The Room is a good movie. It's not. But it is hilariously bad. So, The Disaster Artist is a movie that will be coming out to the theater near you, probably. It's one of the only films this coming weekend that's coming out in wide release. This is a movie I will see. I've been excited to see this movie for quite some time. Especially after I last saw The Room at my favorite Boston theater, the Coolidge Corner Theater. And when I review this, when I see this movie, I will let you know what I think on next week's show. So the other movies that are coming out are those that are coming out in limited release. So they probably won't be coming to a theater near you. Maybe not. But I will let you know what they are. For instance, there's a Woody Allen film coming out called Wonder Wheel. And this is a movie that takes place on Coney Island in the 1950s where a lifeguard tells the story of a middle-aged carousel operator and his beleaguered wife. I can't tell you exactly what characters play who, but I can tell you that the actors in the movie include Jim Belushi, Juno Temple, Justin Timberlake and Kate Winslet. Those are the main characters. And the movie, of course, has been written by and directed by the incomparable Woody Allen. So Woody Allen, having made making a film almost every year the same way he does, has some movies that are really good and some that are bad. The fact that he has Kate Winslet in this movie is an asset. 
uh, Jim Belushi can act well sometimes. Justin Timberlake probably acted well in one movie he was in. That's the social network, but has not quite lived up to that acting standard in the movies he has been in since then, probably with the exception of the Coen Brothers movie he did, which is the the title of which is slipping my mind right now. But I, I'm, I'm still going to see this movie, I, of course, with Woody, with any movie, but most especially with Woody Allen movies, I'm going to go in with an open mind. The fact that it's a period piece actually might be an asset to the film as well. So I'm very interested to see what this movie is like. And when I see this film, it may not be next weekend, but it will probably be soon. I will let you know what I think. But it may, it may be next week, it may be the week after. Either way, I will eventually see this film because I know in its limited release, it will eventually open up in Boston. So another movie that's coming out, which is looking like an Oscar contender, is one by Guillermo del Toro, which he produced, wrote, or at least co-wrote, and directed. The movie is called The Shape of Water, and it's about an otherworldly fairy tale th- set against the backdrop of the civil of Cold War era America circa 1962. In the hidden high-security government laboratory where she works, lonely Eliza, who's played by Sally Hawkins, is trapped in a life of isolation. Eliza's life has changed forever when she and co-worker Zelda discover... Whoa! Let's get crazy! In movies, when someone at a party jumps into a pool fully dressed, everyone cheers them on and jumps in too. Just so you know, in real-life parties, nobody jumps in after you. You just look stupid. Come on, jump in. Come on. Most party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I was actually discussing the plot of The Shape of Water right before I got cut off for a commercial break, but let me start over. The Shape of Water is an otherworldly fairy tale set against the backdrop of Cold War era America circa 1962. In the hidden high security government laboratory where she works, lonely Eliza, who's played by Sel- uh, Sal... Sally Hawkins, is trapped in a life of isolation. Eliza's life is changed forever when she and co-worker Zelda, who's played by Academy Award winner Octavia Spencer, discover a secret classified experiment. And that's all the movie's telling me so far. So as I said before, the movie stars Sally Hawkins, Octavia Spencer, and also stars Michael Shannon and Doug Jones. So coming from Guillermo del Toro, who you might remember from having directed both Hellboy movies as well as Pan's Labyrinth, the latter of which is one of my all-time favorite movies. Not in the top five, but it's, it's still up there. The Shape of Water has a lot to live up to, but... I'm really excited to see it, and of course, when you have great actors like Sally Hawkins and Octavia Spencer in it, it promises a lot, and unfortunately, I know this film won't be coming to a theater near you unless you are living in New York City. Yeah, it's only opening in New York City. A lot of times when they say open in select cities, they mean usually New York and L.A., and maybe they expand to San Francisco, Chicago, Miami. But Boston is probably, I guess, number nine or number ten on the list of cities. But then again, you know, my hometown of Waterville, Maine, (laughs) probably would have been number 262 on the list of theaters you know, that it it would open exclusively at. But just a minor grievance. Again, that's the way the movie industry works. I can't complain. If I did, who would listen? So anyway, The Shape of Water is going to be coming out to theater near you eventually, just not next weekend. But if I do see that movie and it may and they may open it somewhere in Boston, I'll see it and I'll let you know what I think. 
So the other limited release movies include one called Love Beats Rhymes. And this is a movie about a struggling rapper named Coco. And it's very unfortunate that she's named Coco after the Disney Pixar movie that comes out. But either way, she is a rapper who's played by Azealia Banks who enrolls in a poetry excuse me, a poetry class. And she thinks her rhymes will impress her teacher, Professor Dixon, who's played by actually another singer, Jill Scott. Instead, Dixon challenges Coco to seek real meaning in her lyrics, setting her on a journey of discovery that takes her through rap clubs and poetry slams, leading her to find her true voice and true love in this uplifting movie co-starring Lucien Laviscount, I'm not sure who that is, and Common, I definitely know who that is. And also, uh, the movie is actually directed by RZA, of the Wu-Tang Clan, who's directed a few other films and also provided music for uh, movies like Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2, and it also co-stars Method Man, also of the Wu-Tang Clan. And I'm going to tell you, this is in limited release. I'd love to see this movie. I really hope it's coming out in a theater near me because it sounds amazing in terms of story, and it also has a lot of really good um, rapper slash singers who might do well as actors in this movie. The only one I'm doubtful of is Azealia Banks, because Azealia Banks is a controversial rapper. I mean, even more controversial than Nicki Minaj. So I'm not sure how she would do in a movie like this. Again, rappers and singers are somewhat hit or miss sometimes, but... Ones who are experienced in acting, like Jill Scott or Common, they turn in really good performances. But ones who are making their feature debut, like Azealia Banks, they might not do as well. But either way, if this movie comes out in a theater near me, I will seek it out. I will see it, and I'll let you know what I think for next week's show. Very quickly, last movie I'm going to just give you a brief synopsis on is one called Gangsterland, and this is the story about America's most famous mobsters and their rise to power. It examines Al Capone's ascension through the eyes of his second-in-command, Machine Gun Jack McGurn, and I guess there are some other gangsters who are dramatized in this crime drama. I don't know how this movie's going to be. It stars Sean Ferris, Milo Gibson, Jason Patrick, and Jamie Lynn Sig- Sigler, uh, the latter of whom played Meadow Soprano in The Sopranos. And mm, I don't know. I, I don't know if this movie's come out in the theater near me. It might be video on demand, but either way, if, if I come across it, I might see it. I'll let you know what I think. But that just about does it for this week's edition of Words on Film following Thanksgiving. So this is Dan Burke, your host and movie critic, just reminding you that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of employees working at the station that's airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So I hope you enjoyed Words on Film, whether you agreed with me or disagreed with me. And until next week, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies. 